Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to a very special occasion, purely for your entertainment tonight. We are your hosts, Lionheart, Mike Nikos, and I'm here with the Executioner, Michael X, and welcome to Open Mike Night. The execution of Michael X. Uh, so this is a twofer. Uh, we usually don't do twofers, but we decided to for this uh, specifically because why the hell not? We've been saying that we wanted to do two different things for this podcast specifically, so why not? Yeah. So why don't we get into it? Sure. Uh, this specific topic, um, I mean, recently just came out of nowhere. Like while I was trying to think for the first topic, I. So my sister, she was watching the first night of the museum until so she got to the ending where she asked me, hey, Mike, what's the name of the song that's playing? I'm like, oh, that's uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, September. And she's just like, oh, weird song. So I just go on YouTube and I listen to the full song. I'm like, man, this song really defined the 70s. But then it got me thinking on that idea of what I just said, like a song that defines a decade. Well, it's definitely one of the songs that defines the decade. Oh yeah, there, there it's not it's not songs. absolute like nineteen seventies song. It's definitely the seventies disco scene. A lot mm-hmm. of people would argue the point of oh, you're not going to choose uh, such incredible bands like uh, Led Zeppelin or I mean, the fuck, Jackson uh, Five. the Jackson Five or or, or even uh, Black Sabbath because that's when they uh, first appear is in the nineteen seventies, their first big album. Of uh, sure, sure. You know, Black, Black Sabbath's first album, which is Black Sabbath. Um, what a thunk it. Who would have guessed? Uh, but it, it's more of the fact that if you're talking about the 70s as a whole, I would say honestly, there's five songs that could define a generation if you know where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. No matter who you are, there's always those five specific songs that you know off the top of your head that you can go, that is honestly how to describe the 1970s. Oh, yeah. The different types of beats and rhythms used for each song, the the style for music videos and such. You take one glance at it and think, yeah, that's the sum of their parts that literally defines that era of the decade. But the question I want to ask is, what about the other decades starting from, let's say, the 40s or 50s and working our way up to our current generation? Well, you can't have the 1950s without talking about the man, the myth, the legend himself, Elvis Elvis goddamn Presley. Oh, thanks. He is the crux of of that time period. True. There's no denying that. There have been so many songs written from this guy, it's hard to define, like, which song would you recognize as, like, Written, I wouldn't say, because a lot of the stuff that it turns out Elvis kind of took from African American uh, culture, blues songs, oh, yeah. and he just reworked a lot of it. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely the creation of something that's brand new. Um, so why don't why don't you start with yours? We'll start from I, I honestly think the '40s is a little far back, but I have no problem doing that. So why don't you start first, good sir? Give me a take on yours, and you and I together. Uh, with our with our big uh, discography lineup that is in our heads, could li- at least line up what the top five songs of those decades, or at least the songs that definitely represent those decades to the fullest extent. Oh, sure. Um, I kind of went a little overboard. I started going back all the way to the 40s, which is not too bad from what are we originally will look at, which is the 50s. But if there's one it's, song that I feel like decade. I could sum up in the 40s, early 40s, uh, during World War II, um, I would say, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the, the band, I think they're Inkblots, 
I don't want to set the world on fire. Now that's a it's good like, choice. Yeah. Honestly, it's a classic. Um, in a way that is very specific to the time period. One thing that people do forget about that song is uh, what it represents, which a lot of people have uh, placed it in as the, well, this song represents uh, represents the nuclear Armageddon to eventually come of the 1940s. And I go, I don't think that the people from the 1940s would see it that way. Because during their it's time, just... it was a completely different ideology. Oh, true. At first, at first glance, while I listened to the song, I thought it was like one of those old slow jam love songs that people in the 40s would jam out to. But once you got a little bit on the lyrics, it would seem that, yeah, the whole nuclear arms race that the subliminal message they have kind of makes them think that it's not there. It's just more kind of feels propagandic to me. A little bit. I mean, it's it's one of those, when you take where it is located in its time period, it's one of those songs of, this is what represents this specific decade of time. Uh, obviously, you have to go with something classic like Dean Martin, if you're going like a little bit farther back. Mm-hmm. But... As a song of the as a song of the time, I would say it's a good representation of probably the crux between the forties and fifties, probably right at the end of World War Two specifically. Yep. Now, if you're talking about the forties, you can't talk. You can't even if you attempt to avoid it. You cannot stop talking about the Rat Pack themselves. Nice. You, you cannot avoid it, even if you try. You, you cannot avoid the Rat Pack, because eventually you are going to have to talk about Sammy Davis Jr., uh, our boy Frank Sinatra, and Dean Martin coming together to become probably one of the most iconic trio vocalists ever with oh, incredible true, true. music behind them with each individual track that they've made. Made movies, appeared in Las Vegas casino venues, all that jazz. I mean, they were Vegas. They were mm-hmm. Las Vegas. There's no denying that. They were they were Vegas in every sense of the word. I mean, without any of those gentlemen. So I would say personally, you know, a lot of people would say, ain't that a kick in the head? I would somewhat agree with, but I would say, honestly, Fly Me to the Moon is the most 40s thing you could ever make. Oh, yeah. It's very good, very open when it comes to its beat, has a very good sound to it, and is a representation of the time uh, of its own way. I know it probably came out a little bit later, but when you hear it, you have a vision in your head of a very simple time period. Oh, true, yeah. I think it came out like around the early 50s, if I'm not mistaken, correct? It came out in the early, as I said, it's one of those time period songs that you hear it and Remember, Vegas is starting to come around in the end of the 40s. So it's one of those, you cannot be blamed for thinking that it came out in the 40s. Because it's exactly what it sounds like. That's the time period that it's stuck in. Of course. Now moving on from the 40s, uh, we get to the 50s. If there's one song that... I think defines that era in the fifties. Um, it, it's got to be something from Presley. Um, I can't help falling in love with you. I feel like that's just like. No, that's fair. That, Honestly, that's yeah. probably the best. That's probably the best song that he's had in his entire disog- uh, discography. Discography. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I can't speak English today. Wouldn't be the first time, and it won't be the last that I can't speak the fucking language that I have grown up with. Um. Yeah. But, yeah, it's very good. It's a very good track. It's very smooth, uh, very specific in nature, and doesn't have a lot in the tonal range. But it's very. Yeah. Qu- it's a very quiet song. That's how I imagined the 50s in that area. It was like, it's a time of peace, very quiet, not a whole lot of rowdiness in like, the music industry. Something like Elvis Presley in this music, where it's just... It feels very genuine, very calm. Very, it's something that you can vibe to. Something very laxed, if you would. Yeah. All right, okay, I got one you for you. Good, sir? 
let the good times roll. Ooh, now, I know a lot of people are sitting there going, you mean the song by Queen? No, 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 no. Uh, there was, I have at least two choices that I uh, specifically keep in my head whenever I need it. Uh, and that's one of the big ones. Let the Good Times Roll is one of the songs of, this is the representation of the 50s, finally getting rid of the World War II era um, problems and finally going into a civilization of light. Yep. In its own way. I see. Yeah. I mean, plus, Honestly, I mean, it, I does just... help. it does help that you and I played a shit ton of Mafia, too, so. Oh, Where yeah. that whole soundtrack is just fantastic. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I wish there'd be, like, a return for that type of music genre where it's just more relaxed, like, in the 50s era. But we'll get into, like, some of the songs that have been changing over time. And speaking of the songs that will change over time, let's move on to songs that started to emerge into a, a good pace, good tempo during the 60s. Uh, so if we're going for the 60s, I have two specific choices in mind. And I think this is the best way to really describe the 60s. Pre-Vietnam. Sure. And during Vietnam. Because Vietnam doesn't end until the 70s. Yeah. That's the best way to really figure out the pocket of time that you're in. Oh, of course. When it comes to the 60s. So, your first choice, good sir? Man, for the 60s. Because uh... you have to pick two. It's one of those you have to pick two because it's two very specific differentiations in timeline. It's two sure. different decades, if you would. Of course. And here's what I'm going to do I am not going, and this is also a rule that we're going to have to make for this. We are allowed to only use one band member per era. We can't do more than two. I feel like that'd be only be fair because we want to give the other artists and band members a chance. So for me, uh, first is going to be uh, Bob Dylan's Times Are Changing, which was released in the early 60s, which I think is pretty relevant today. I mean, it's one of those most honest song and song lyrics you will ever hear because... So you're not it, choosing it because it was in the movie Watchmen? That's only half the reason. <laughs> I love that there's no denial. It's it's very important. Don't deny it. It's absolutely true that, that movies and media have definitely uh, helped choose the uh, the musical structure that you enjoy. Oh, yeah. And when you get to reading the lyrics of Times Are Changing, it just it, it just fits in that that time era where it just it advances to what our current generation is facing like it's one of those songs that it, it's kind of like history you're doomed to repeat it if you don't know a whole lot of it and my second choice for the 60s so it's finally vietnam time good sir yep it's vietnam time and what better way than to start with fortunate son because I feel like that song is like... The it song is, it is, is absolutely, like, it is absolutely the time period in which it, it is the most Vietnam era song that you could ever have. It's like track one of the Vietnam soundtrack. Which, uh, if nobody knows the joke at that front, it is a, a specific comedian uh, named <laughs> Robbie Williams has said, uh, if, if you had a song that defined a generation, my God, you could never pick anything other than, and there's no denying it, Fortunate Son. Because it, it is the definition of a decade and shows that things were changing. Not for the best, not for the worst, but things were eventually changing. Oh, indeed. And I'm really glad that they were using lot of songs from the past to bring it up to the present like you would not believe the amount of times this song has been used for memes which actually fits to the narrative and mm -hmm. would you believe Agreed. it or not that I, I never knew this song existed if i never watched any documentaries of vietnam never played any games with vietnam music i had to look that up through memes the first time i heard that song it's crazy 
I mean, it's it's one of those. Well, I grew up with you know my old man's musical taste is the classic stuff, the good mm-hmm. shit, the really good shit, and I grew up in a household where that was you know I just heard it constantly, uh, not on a daily basis, but I heard it constantly. So sure. it, it it changed uh, my uh, depiction of you know just just uh, I guess you could say musical taste. Of what the shit that I like because my folks liked it. Uh-huh. But um, if you want a song to define the '60s, I'm gonna have to go with Beatles Mania, good sir. Ooh, yeah, the rise of Beatlemania. And specifically, it's um, oh god, it's Helter Skelter. Skelter. Never heard of it. Helter Skelter's on the White Album. Ah. Could you explain more on that? White Album is what I like to call the Beatles trying to go hard. The Beatles attempting a new format. And I hate to say that it works. Hmm. Incredibly well so. It, It is one of those, if you take it in the time period that it's in, it works. Yeah. It just works. And Helter Skelter, which would later become uh, words written by famous 1970s killer. Um, and I know Helter Skelter is not a, a 60 song specifically, but I feel like the White Album itself is, is a, a product of the time. I mean, if I had to pick one for specifically the 60s, even though it somewhat works, um, I would honestly have to pick um god i i would honestly have to pick something from um bob dylan yeah bob dylan i i I honestly have to agree with the choice at that point it's the perfect 60s song it's the beginning of of the time actually changing and, and and a switch from normal war into something so much grittier and not great honestly yeah, and, and you personal taste. What you can't understand, kids. I mean, th- it's the first time ever that we've had a country that was redivided again because of not race, not anything of that interest, but of principle of of what mattered most in the people's hearts, and fighting in a war that nobody agreed with. Oh, of course. So if I'm if I'm picking the Vietnam song, I'm gonna pick "Painted Black," "Paint It Black" by the Rolling Stones. Agreed. That's another classic song. It is. I put, I like to say it as the mindset of the soldier. Eventually, what they are going to become. Cool. Sweet. I'm actually surprised you didn't choose Sympathy for the Devil because I know that song was repeated in a bunch Sympathy of times. Sympathy for the Devil is absolutely one of the one of the cruxes. I mean, Rolling Stones in general during this time is the most important time for the for the Stones ever. There's yeah, and no the doors. That. The Doors a little bit less because I mean, let's be honest, you could have the '60s without the Doors and you would be fine. There really isn't that much besides maybe break on through to the other side, but that didn't come out to like the late seventies. Um, but if you're talking about a classic track, painted black just has more than just, you know, lyrical structure that works with it. It's more of, if you place yourself in the mindset, it works in more than just a singular way. Uh-huh. Uh, so I guess we're going into the 1980s or sorry, we're going into the seventies now. Finally. Yep, the 70s, the rise of disco. and The rise of disco and the beginning of the cocaine empire. Uh-huh. That is Miami, Florida. Yeah. So, 70s, I never regarded as, like, the great time for music. I thought, like, the 80s was a bit better. But the 70s had some good music, too. And for the one song besides September that I feel like define the 70s. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's got to be the Bee Gees, Staying Alive. Yes, yeah, the Bee Gees, 100%. I can't even disagree with that. The Bee Gees defines the 70s. 
you will never get a more 70s disco era song than something by the Bee Gees. Yeah. Almost every one of their songs just hits those notes where it's just like, yep, 70s. Any other song that tries to compete with them? Nah. The Bee Gees is king. Like, the kings of fucking disco. Though, I may have to disagree. The 70s that divide the era, yes, I agree that their music is great enough for that era, but sure, there were some other bands that you know, the groups that defined the 70s in their own way of music. So, I guess I might have to also include this one to the 70s list. Um, sure. Oh, God. I have to say Simon and Garfunkel was also a bit of a, in the 70s groove. Like, uh, Don't Stop, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water. I feel like that was a song that, like, oh, yeah, it's like a bit of a groovy. Well, plus, you had the... Garfunkel than Simon, man. That sure. is absolutely the Simon song, or sorry, the Garfunkel song on that track. And it's, yeah. god damn, is it so good. True. And uh, what about you, sir? Well, let's see. The 1970s is the birth of what I like to call crazy good rock and roll. This is the mm-hmm. birth of rock finally becoming its own thing. So I'm going to pick Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. Ooh. Cashmere by Led Zeppelin is a very, very good track. Not the best, not the best that they've ever produced, but it is very good for what it does, and that's the tonal shift in the, in the chorus. It does something very specific that not a lot of people do enjoy, but what it does is very enjoyable. Oh, agreed. Um, if I had to choose, honestly, I'm kind of tossed up between Zeppelin and Sabbath for what they represented, which in the 1970s is the most important thing. I would honestly have to say the most important band between the two is always going to be Sabbath. Because Zeppelin's great. Nobody will ever deny that Stairway to Heaven is one of the most important songs of all time. But Sabbath's first track for their goddamn album which is called black sabbath is so good true it's not the best but it is so delicious because it's a twist of tone oh indeed and if Isn't i had to pick probably that funky disco time period mm-hmm. i'm gonna have to say um Let's Groove Tonight by Earth, Wind, and Fire. That's good. And Earth, Wind, and Fire is also a really well-recognized era for the 70s. It, also, it, I, it's undeniable, honestly. True. Also, what was the name of the, the group that sang the song, uh, The Rubber Band Man? Was that a 70s group, or it was more towards that's the 80s? 70. No, that's the yeah. 70s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Man, man, man. Rubber band man's very I, good. The only reason I know that song is because of, of uh, Infinity War. Oh, really? I thought you were going to say Casey because that's that's the only song I've ever heard Casey sing. I'm going to be 100% honest. Oh, the only oh no. I'm so fine. No, when, when I was watching Infinity War, as soon as that song played, right before we get introduced to the Guardians, my head was just tilting. And bobbing back and forth while the guys looking around me, they're just looking at me like, "Are you okay, dude?" I'm like, "What? I'm just jamming out to the Rubber Band Man, dude." This shit be funky, yo. <laughs> yeah. So I so, guess uh, moving, we're moving. Yeah, moving on from the '70s, we got to the '80s. We got to, we get to the fun part of the decade. And honestly, there are a lot of good songs in the '80s generation. So to really Sum it up between one song. I feel like that'd be a little too harsh. So, yeah, well, we're gonna have to stick with like the why two song make, limit for it. Why don't we make? Why don't we make it three? Why sure. not just cut make it through shit and go with the three songs that define the '80s from three different musical genres that really did start coming around 
in the 80s so and true. it's most in its highest priority. So true. I, I even had, you know, I had trouble like picking up which one really defined the 80s. So to put it into three, the first song is going to be Bruce Springsteen, Born in the USA. I always thought that song was made after Vietnam, like during the 70s, but when I looked it up, I was like, oh, 1984, that's like really well relevant during that area but yeah it's just one of those songs that's like really defined that era of the 80s it's a really good song and i just feel like people would like get the chance to really uh, really feel more patriotic when they listen to the song uh even though it it has a complete anti-fucking you know Oh yeah, yeah. You're right. Have you heard the lyrics? It's completely anti fucking war. It's the it's the best anti war song you're gonna get. Oh true. That's yeah. exactly what it's supposed to represent is, is the anti war uh estab- anti war establishment that oh, was true, going true. on there. Uh second song. Well, I don't know how did I know? How did you know? Simple. I don't know. It's just that way. It's just that type of style. Like the moment you see the music video, you're thinking, "This can't be '80s," but no, uh, it's it's really '80s when you think about it. Just that pace, that energy, the flow. It fits to its natural perspective. And finally, so how number- fast is one of us gonna say, "Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down"? Oh no, no. I, I, originally, I was. But not. Nah. But for my final number third, you can't have 80s without Africa by Toto. That song, super good. Even I can't deny it. Oh, it's it. very good. Like, can you imagine that not many places, like some of the karaoke bars that I visit, they don't have this song listed in like their 80s category because, oh, it's not 80s. Like, what do you mean? Of course it is. But really, this song just kind of... It's like one of those songs that was like emerging from the 80s up until the 90s. It was like that type of groove area, but it just feels very synth pop if you really take a look at it. Like the way it sounds... Oh, that's a fair, that's a fair standpoint, honestly. But either way, really good. Uh, what about you, sir? I'm going to start it off with honestly, and I'm shocked that we have not, I've never talked about this group. But I'm going to have to start with Run DMC. Uh, specifically, um, oh, God, there's so many good songs to fucking choose from. Um, probably I'm the King of Rock. Mm-hmm. It's super good. If you want a song that's like, Rap has finally become this big thing, or at least is getting to that point. Hip hop is finally getting into the rap formatted scene. I mean, I could have easily just said, I'm going to pick the fucking Beastie Boys, but I'm like, eh, you know what? Maybe not. I'm not going to go with the Beastie Boys. I like the Beastie Boys. I really do enjoy the Beastie Boys, but you're trying to make me choose between two very good bands, and I'm going to choose the one that I really do enjoy listening to. As much as I do. Um, heavy metal starting to come around. A lot more. It's yep. becoming this big. Uh, scary thing honestly. And I'll say it. You can't talk about. 80's metal. Without talking about Def Leppard. I mean you obviously have Van Halen. I won't deny Van Halen. Van Halen's very fucking good. But and Slayer. And Slayer. I always considered Slayer more of the 90s, because that's just how it feels to me personally. Fair enough. But yeah, Def Leppard. Def Leppard, uh, is... specifically Hysteria, super mm-hmm. good. Oh, it's and, fine, that era in the 80s. Oh, well, I mean, uh, Rock of Ages defines the... Rock of Ages more specifically defines the 80s. Uh-huh. 
And for my final choice, personally, because I really just enjoy this song and band. Okay, we're talking about the 80s. We're talking about a very important time period for music. I'm going to give you the whitest band I could ever give you. Okay. Are you ready? I feel like I know who this is, but go ahead. The new kids on the block. Wow, I was way off. That's a good choice. That's Donnie Wahlberg, ladies and gentlemen. A gentleman that you do not expect to be one of the members of New Kids on the Block. Yeah. (laughs) It's yeah. Uh, he's. I don't know. He he was a rapper, kind of, sort of. I mean, he made like one song for the 1990s, well, 80s, but he made one song. Fair enough. One song of note. Uh, specifically for New Kids on the Block, it's Step Up, which is super good. Step oh, yeah. Up. Super good. Yeah. One second. Of course, for me, I'm surprised we didn't even choose, like, Michael Jackson or Prince, because I feel like those two also define that era of the 80s, but I might have to, you know, pick apart that and right, say, so we, uh... there are... They're more influenced in pop, like pop, pop and R and B that time I heard. Like I'm, I don't know if you uh, heard me, but I said um, I'm surprised we didn't choose either Michael Jackson or Prince because they kind of fit in that category of the '80s. They're, their, like own, to... they're their own category. That's the whole thing. They are complete. They have their sound could be any decade. That's how True. good their shit is. Oh, yeah. Which doesn't take away from what bands we're talking about, but. Come on, we're we're talking. You can't Jackson and him. Their shit's so good that you can't specifically take it into a decade. Like oh, you can true, obviously true. put Death Leopard in a decade. You can put any band into a decade, but it's so fucking hard to do it with Jackson and Prince because their shit's I just know. that. Because their shit's just that good. Yeah. Can I, I look like... at a party like it's nineteen ninety nine? It's super good. Uh-huh. I feel like when I listen to Michael Jackson or Prince, I don't know if it's the lyrics that kind of define the generation, but rather the beats and rhythm that provide it. Because when you hear the beats and rhythm from, say, Purple Rain or Billie Jean, it fits into that type of decade. When you hear oh. the lyrics, I agree with you, it's for every single decade of every single generation. That I'm totally okay with. It's the beats themselves are so good that they can be a part of any decade and any generation. And they have been. I mean, people are still sampling their shit today. True, true. But, but you know what I am shocked that we didn't say for like the 70s, specifically the 70s into the 80s, until like the late 90s? Go ahead. Neither one of us chose, and this is crazy to me, Queen whatsoever. That is true. Queen was hallmarked during the 80s. But Queen is one of those sounds that can never be recreated again. It's one of those things that is a showing that times have changed in such a very drastic but simple way that is so stupidly impressive to me. Because any band can, can say who they are no other band can call themselves Queen. Oh yeah. All right, I got one. That name for, has a uh, that name has a fucking that name has some serious history dedicated to it. Oh yeah. All right, I, I got one for you in the seventies up to eighties scene. Uh, Peter Frampton. Uh, I guess. Frampton was more of the end of the 70s into the 80s, specifically. He's very good. Frampton is very good. He's very good at what he does. Uh, first user of a talk box. 
which as you know is a want wah box. Uh, he, he's very good. Uh, he blew people's minds back in the, back in the late seventies for the fact that nobody knew how the fuck he made his guitar work. Nobody could figure out how he made the guitar talk. So you look up a YouTube video twenty years later and then show it to your friends. Oh yeah, sure. Look up a YouTube video forty five plus years later and show it to your friends, going, "Look at how he did this! Isn't that impressive?" Yeah, it is. Why are you showing me this clip? Because I because I thought it was interesting. You know, I um, first will listen to one of his songs. I actually thought he just put his lips to the strings and just oh, no. talked oh, with the no. vocal cords. Oh no, it's even it's even more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah, I try to use a talk box and it takes forever to actually like learn how to use properly. Um Okay, so we're in the nineties. Yeah, Good sir, I, I'm I gonna just... have I'm gonna have to say it. Pantera. Yeah. Pantera. Specifically, Walk by Pantera is super 90s. Oh, yeah, true. It's super good. If you... You can't... You can't talk about the 90s without talking about Kilgore slash Pantera. They're so good. That band is just good. Oh, yeah. Um... If I had to pick a second, like, God, 90s thing, I know somebody's going to be like, but the Backstreet Boys are in sync. I'd be like, yeah, true. Honestly, prob- uh, one or the other, either or works. I mean, I want it that way. I probably heard more. I, I want it that way. I probably heard more than any other song of the 90s. And it kind of kind of scares me <laughs> some days. <laughs> Yeah, true. I mean, there are a bunch um, of songs that I'm looking through for the '90s, and I'm like, yeah, they they seem to all fit. It's like one of those songs to well, emerge. You want a you want a '90s ass you want a '90s ass band like a '90s ass song and a '90s ass band. I don't remember the name of the band, but I do know the name of the name of the song. Go ahead. Bop. M M M M M capital B capital O capital P Bop. Mm, Bop. Mm-hmm. Never heard of it. Oh boy! Wait till you listen to it. I know that you're gonna eventually go. What is this fucking shit? <laughs> like, That's Wait, the nineties. Hang, hang on, is that the song that goes? Mm-bop, mm-bop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the nineties. Okay. Yeah. It's by three brothers, which is crazy to me. It's like three fucking brothers that all look the same. Interesting. And uh, honestly, I got my last choice here, good sir. My last Man. pick. You cannot talk about the 1990s without talking about Nirvana. At least once. And Smells, smells Like Smells Teen Spirit. Like Spirit. It's the song of the 90s. So while you're finishing that up, your side of the list, I think that we could stop right at the 90s because when you get into the early 2000s, that's such a mixed, mixed bag of shit that it's ridiculous. I mean, there's some good tracks in the but, 2000s, but, it, but it's early you can't really 2000s. Define, but you can't define the early 2000s by a specific set of songs unless you're going to go, okay, here are the three. Slim Shady, Please Stand Up by uh, fucking Eminem. Stop me if you've heard. <laughs> but, yeah, James, what's, uh, got been trying to call me in the middle of the podcast. Call you? Yeah, he just tried to call me in the middle of the podcast. So, um, I'm gonna go take that. You finish up your list. Sure. And uh, uh, yeah. So. For the 90s, it's kind of difficult when I'm trying to figure out, like, some of the songs that kind of define that era. A lot of people will say they'll get their favorite 90s songs from movies during that era. Like, for instance, Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On, Whitney Houston's yep. I Will Always Love You. Yeah, they're, they're really good songs, but, I mean, that's just their own thing. When I want to listen to the songs in the 90s, I want to really... Think, just want to sit down and think about what song 
through beats, lyrics, actually make up the nineties. So so and, Nikos, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go answer this call. Sure thing. I'll just keep talking about this. Yeah, I I'm gonna go do something really quick. So yeah. when you're dummy obviously. Um, just end the call, and then that way we'll have the first half done. Sure, yeah. Okay, man. I, I'll I'll be right back. Sure, thanks. And while Mike does that, let me tell you about Deja Vu's running in the 90s. Yeah, I'm going there. That song fits the 90s. Just the name. I listen to it, you're just in that pace. Eurobeat, the real bands, or the real group who made the song. Phenomenal. The, the best type of music you're going to get to is just watching from an old anime, and it really shows. Even, I had to do my research about this, like, if this song was, wasn't really made for the 90s, but no, nah, it's in the 90s, and I'm glad it's in the 90s. Just in the fact, like, the opening... It's like something you wouldn't hear, especially here. It's like when you listen to the song through your earbuds, like one song goes in one earbud, the other one goes in the other. It just kind of trails in to a, a nice beat that really gets your blood flowing. And it's a perfect song used for just almost anything. And the way I would think about it, just when you listen to that song, it's just when you're driving like really fast and that adrenaline picks up, Along with the song, I feel like yeah. Better. Now I have the... heard you are no longer talking like a crazy person towards a phantom audience. Oh really? I thought that's all I've been doing since the beginning of this podcast. Oh, that's uh, look at you, you funny fuck. <laughs> <laughs> where this? When did this humor come in? That's impressive. Big question is, where does this laughing track come from? Where's, where's this humor coming from and how come I can't find it? Um, sure. All right, you, you want a song? You, you want you want three bands to define the fucking early 2000s? Sure. Okay. Trapped, Eminem, Limp Biscuit. If I had to choose a fourth to be Kid Rock. I would like to counter that. Though they are good bands, they are good groups and musicians. Hey, like except, for except for yeah. Limp Biscuit. Except for Limp Biscuit. Limp was just like, eh. like What a I weird did, time did. period. What a weird fucking time period to be a music fan is that when Limp Biscuit comes around going, I pick a chainsaw. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> True. Uh, yeah, I like to counter that with three bands or groups. Outcast, Aya, yeah, because obviously. Derude Sandstorm, and yes, that is a early 2000s song. Okay. And Daft Punk, One More Time. What was that? One more time? Daft, Did you say that? Daft Punk, Daft Punk, oh, oh. <laughs> you almost had me. I had you till you realized. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. No, I got something for you. Shoot. I full 65. I am blue. Da ba dee da ba da. Or if you have really shitty headphones, if I was green, I would die. If I. <clears throat> yeah, you're very correct. Yeah. I'm blue if Honestly, I was. I would Honestly, die. that's like one of the most misheard lyrics in that song. No one knows if it's double D double da or if I was green, I would die. But hey, do it their own. Hey, do it their own. All right, I got one for you. What's a band that you've listened to from the early 2000s that nobody else really does? Ooh, a band I've listened to from the early 2000s. Um... Go over the nineties. The nineties is a bunch of obscure as fuck bands that not a lot of people know about, but the early two thousands is a lot of obscure as shit stuff too. All right, I got one. I don't know if many people still listen to this, but at one point I listened to it because one of their songs was really good. 
Coldplay. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, you can send me the hate mail, spam the hate comments in the chat. I listened to Coldplay for a time. Oh, yeah? Good. But did you accept Coldplay with arms wide open? Because I listened to Creed. Unironically as well. I actually liked like two Creed songs. Oh man, that's even worse. I mean, yeah, but I feel like the old olds, which is kind of a, a weird era of mixing 90s, 80s, 70s, and all the other generations into more hip-hop, R&B type songs, which people will consider as like a new trend, but I don't know. It's just those songs that like, you listen to it, it's you kind of weird... it a bit. It's a weird, the early, to, the mid-2000s, honestly, is a fucking weird time period. Unless you're into Gorillaz. Then Gorillaz was fantastic. Oh, true, true. If you were super into Gorillaz, like young Mikey was, who had, like, the posters and the fucking, the t-shirts, Gorillaz was the coolest shit ever, because how do you describe, how do you describe that band to somebody? Oh, they're an animated 2D band that has about 20 plus members in it. Yeah. Well, they do punk music. Well, they also do rock and roll. Well, they also do metal. Well, they also do synthetic wave. Well, they also do rap. What yeah. is this band? And how do I? How do I? Like consume its life energy to become stronger. True. True. But uh, yeah, I feel like we brought up our case on. Songs that kind of define each decade. Of course, we're not going to go forward into the 2010s, 2020s, because honestly, like what Mike said, it's a mixed bag. Not really many, not a lot of good songs. Or I mean, there were some good songs, but just not a lot of memorable songs that would define the decade. As I said, you kind of get starts a point. Getting, shit starts getting very complicated because new, dude, people are trying to recreate old shit now. <laughs> yeah. Or using older songs as samples. You know what I mean? I feel like they use older uh, beats from old songs and they just try to hide it through by adding new lyrics. Like, uh, oh God, there was this one song Chris Brown used uh, from an old Michael Jackson song. And everyone was just like, hey, didn't he sample this? Did he get the rights to it? Like nowadays, it's just, it's killing people just trying to come up with their own new beats for their songs, so they just gotta sample it or through remixes from old songs, which I understand coming up with new beats is hard. And I feel like if you're going to sample songs from like the old generation, I feel oh, like fuck. It's... I just my my apologies, I just remembered something. If we're talking about the nineties, we're forgetting a very specific group. Two specific groups, actually. Number one oh. being the NWA. NWA, I think, was uh, in the eighties. Late eighties, but early nineties, because that's when the band splits is in the is in the mid uh, of the nineteen nineties. Oh, true, true. We're forgetting about Tupac, Biggie. We're forgetting about the greatest group of all time because they ain't nothing to fuck with Wu Tang Clan. Facts. I'm actually curious, are they still, like, in the group, or are they just, they split up? They've been split, but they all do their own stuff now. Ghostface Killer does his own thing. Method Man does his own thing. Red Man does his own thing. Oh, true. Like, everybody does their own thing. RZA and Jizza, they do their own stuff. Everybody does their own shit. Of course. I, I, I feel like, yeah, those songs, those artists are good for their own type of subcategory in, in like the music industry. So I, I give it a pass. I'm going to say pass oh, you want... I'm not, like I'm not, I'm not ignoring them. I'm just like, I give them a passing grade for, you know, proving themselves you, to be part you of want the, the most whole... Hate, do you want the most hated band of the 2000s? Oh, boy. Go. You know who it is. I do. You do. I do be do. Dude, you 
honestly do. Because as soon as I say the N that's in their name, you'll know exactly what group I'm talking about. Instinct. No, that's the 90s. Ah, wait, 2000s, right? Yep. One Direction? Nickelback. Ah, Nickelback. A band that doesn't know if they want to be heavy metal or if they want to be pop. Look at this band. Every time I do, it makes me laugh. I don't know. They got a couple good tracks. That are meme worthy. Hmm. That are meme worthy. No, they actually have a couple good songs. Agree to disagree. Yeah, Condestined is actually very good. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I didn't even remember Nickelback. I think it's like one of those. Bands. Nickelback like, is. Hey, you wrote one song that was good. Then you wrote some other songs. And now nah, we throw it in the bin. I wouldn't even. I, I mean, honestly, some of their stuff isn't bad. James has seen a concert with them and he said they're very good in concert. So I, I don't really have an opinion on Nickelback. A lot of people give them a lot of shit, and I understand why. Yeah, true. But it's how do I how do I describe it? Um, Nickelback is the band that doesn't know what type of music they want to make. So they have tracks that are good. Like you know, obviously somebody's going to sit there and say, "Well, Far Away is very good." And I'm going to be, yeah, I'm not going to deny that. Photograph is not a bad song. It's not terrible. But yeah. it's they're the weird band because you don't know what they're going for. It's not like ACDC where you're able to go, yes, and I can listen to one ACDC album and I know every fucking song that they're ever going to make off of one album because it's all the same. Yeah. I really, I, hope we, I really hope we get a comment. Somebody going, is he fucking ACDC bashing? I'd be like, no, I I went to the Black Eyes concert when, a long time ago. There, I know how good the band is. I really enjoy ACDC, so don't give me shit on that. <laughs> I have a band we also forgot to include in our 2000s track. Oh, boy. I feel like you know them. Oh, boy. This guy got pissed off because he was memed to death, even though he wanted to make his band the new Beatles. Go on. You're going to make me say it, aren't you? Uh-huh. Well, I could tell you, but somebody... Once told you that, yeah. I mean, to be fair, you gotta blame the fucking movie that they gave the rights to the music to. Yeah, true. That's, I mean, as soon as it, you, that's their goddamn fault at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you hear that opening, just the opening of the lyric, you know exactly what it is, what's it gonna be. What type of era is going to produce for? And Smash Mouth just kind of baited themselves into it. And I could understand the animosity the guys feel like when they were like, oh, fuck this movie. We were going to be the new Beatles. But let's be real. You, you can't really top the Beatles. I mean, you what, you mean is you were gonna, what, what you mean is you were going to steal a bunch of songs from the Beatles. Yeah. If we're going to start telling the truth, we need to tell the truth completely. And it wouldn't be the first time they stole anything from other artists. Mm -hmm. Like, look at I'm a Believer, which was a song originally sung by the band, and this is going to be my new favorite band because of the title, The Monkees. Mm hmm they were in uh they were in Scooby Doo. Which, yeah. Wait, Smash Mouth or the Monkeys? The Monkeys. 
Ah. Hell, they had their own cartoon back in the day. <laughs> like, if you want to talk about, like, your 60s slash 70s trippy band that worked with the time period that they were in, the Scooby-Doo hiatus, if you want to call it. Yeah. The cocaine Scooby-Doo. Um, <laughs> you can't untalk about it. Sure, of course. No, it's like that, like that type of era where it just kind of fits perfectly. It, it fits. And of course, they hate with the monkeys. I mean, for God's sakes, they were around the same time as Arch, uh, fucking Archie Comics, being at their highest point, and Archie having his own TV show. You know, besides the current one. True, true. Which has one of the brothers from fucking Zack and Cody in it, which is really weird. Huh. As Jughead. Ah. I understand that we there are other bands that we left out, but and some of those bands are actually really good to their standards, and to the fact that all of them could be fit into the decade is fine. I'm not going to argue with anyone saying that, oh, if you name this band, what about this band? This band's actually better. And I could disagree or agree with you. I mean, they are good. Some of them could be better. But it's just my opinion. I could say how it is. If you can disagree with it, I'd be okay with it. But when listening to music, I understand, like, there's got to be that special idea. Like, when you're listening to music, you just got to really think about it through the lyrics, through the beats. And I feel like what this experiment was, was how can we listen to music that we've listened throughout the years and years that we've been on this earth and think, how could it define the decade through this type of style of music? And I'm glad to say it kind of worked well to our favor. Don't you agree? Agreed. So why don't we take a uh, commercial break? Fuck it. Yeah. We will be taking a short commercial break. When we come back, we will talk about something that we barely talked about on Indie Force because we were busy making fools of ourselves. When we come back, you were, we will be we, we were our entering a new verse, if you would. About the upcoming. Yeah. When we come back, we'll be talking about our thoughts for Into the Spider Verse 2. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. A table from hell with the Psycho Asylum. <laughs> An Iron Man match of factorial proportions. Man. In this fight, I will melt you down to slag. Versus machine. I calculate a 0.85% chance that you will win in your current condition. All metal I'm mayhem. Colleen Horizon. When you throw me into the wolves, I will return leading the pack. Vera McGarden. And I'll do anything to be the warrior on top. For the Athena title, best friends turned bitter rivals. Johnny Stark. Don't get in the way to start or you'll get burned. James, the Archangel. I'm the real star of this brand. For the international title, the outsider. Mark Young, the executioner. Michael X. For the WIW World Heavyweight title. Two out of three fall. Inside. In a hell. In, in a cell. cell. WIW Immortal. Now available on YouTube. If you like the content that you saw today, make sure you check out For The Win Productions and subscribe to the affiliates of this conglomerate. A Simple Man Studios, Insanity Works Studios, Genelee's Beauty Slam, J. Hebert Studios, Wrestling Fortune 44 Incorporated, Owen the Talkinator Studios, and of course, Weymouth Youth Wrestling. All in the J. Hebert Side 95 modules. Subscribe today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Open Mic Night. Into the Spider-Verse! This is yeah. our... This is gonna be our really serious discussion and our th final thoughts about this because we didn't get a chance to talk about it in the last two Indie Force episodes. So, we're taking this time to fully express what we think about Into the Spider-Verse 2. First off... So, no, go ahead. Like, honestly. It, 
it's it god it's gonna look great honestly i can't even like deny it it's gonna be good oh yeah i, I mean, mean Miles is coming back again, which is very aw- that's awesome to see him return. Yep. We're well, gonna yeah, finally the get. Well, tr- I mean, true, but let me ask you a question because I feel like it's important. What sure. Spider-Man do you want to have appear into the Spider Verse? Honestly, Tobey Maguire, but I feel like. I think they're only going to do comic. I think they're only going to do the comics and the animated. I think those are the only ones they can actually do. Uh, I was hoping like someone would, you know, animate the the same Raimi web suit and just have Tobey Maguire like voice act. I feel like they were going to do for that. But then when I first watched Into the Spider Verse, uh, some of the scenes from Peter B. Parker's universe were identical to the ones we've seen in the. Sam Raimi films, so like the instant, for instance, the um, the whole dancing scene where Peter's like, "Oh, we don't talk about that one." I feel like, "Oh, that's a clever comeback," but I don't know. It just feels like that's appropriate to that uh, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man because of how oh. that Spider-Man Peter B. Parker would fit so well with Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. But if not him, um, God, I'm really hoping that. Someone would animate the Mark Webb Spider Man, you know, bring Andrew Garfield back into the scene to voice act. Maybe, but I think the problem with Andrew Garfield coming back is those movies did not do well. Those are probably like Sony's biggest fuck ups ever. Well, is... I wouldn't say they're the biggest fuck ups. I mean, Spider Man 2 with McGuire is actually the highest, grossest Marvel standalone film ever made. The model data, like the house. And I, I can see why. I mean, you get, if you, you know, remove all the goofy editing, the dialogue, it's actually really good. I wish I could say the same for Spider-Man 3 or the Mark Webb Spider-Man, but, you know, what can you do? Sony tried to make a standalone Spider-Man film, like, five times. Why? But, uh, Mike, what do you think uh, could make a return for in the uh, Spider-Verse? Okay. So I have to talk about the Spider-Man that first entered into the Spider-Verse. The 1990s cartoon made by Fox, uh, which was the, I guess you could call it the Spider-Man version of the X-Men cartoon. You know, trying to be faithful to the comics and the source material and shit like that. Um, yeah. First off, Intro is badass, done by the lead guitarist of Aerosmith, which is fucking sick. One of the best themes ever for, for the web slinger himself. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he meets like a good chunk of Spider Man. Specifically, oh, he meets like he meets Miguel O'Hara. He meets that Spider Man. Yeah. And it, it, that is my favorite depiction of the character for the fact that I grew up with that version of Spider-Man. I grew up with the best interpretation of Venom ever. Miguel O'Hara. Well, Miguel O'Hara Hara is one of the coolest spider man well, No denying that. But when it comes to Eddie Brock, and Eddie Brock's Venom and, and Maximum Carnage arc is incredible. That whole arc, Eddie and, and Carnage being born... Like, or yeah. should I say, Eddie being reborn and Carnage being born is just yeah. awesome. That whole arc yeah. is super cool. Especially when he gets to team up with the X-Men. He gets to fucking meet Iron Man, Captain America. He teams up with War Machine. Like, he actually is involved with other comic book characters other than just the basic and the obvious. Oh, yeah, true, true. And from what I said earlier about Meg Gilhara, yeah, that's another character I wish would we do want to see into Spider-Verse 2. Because I feel like it'd be interesting. Not a, not a whole lot of people know about Miguel Hero except for, you know, animated series and that one Spider-Man game. And the one including for the skins in Spider-Man PS4. Which is well done, I'll have to say. Oh, of course. And as well as... What the... 
fuck am I looking at? Uh, you're right there, Mike. Nikos, what the fuck is WWE Thunderdome? Excuse me? Sorry, James. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry to kind of break the, uh, the in, right in the moment canon. Holy shit, breaking news. What are we yeah. So, WIW wanted to do a match type, which was pretty much the Elimination Chamber, but done the way that we would want to do it, uh, which is just minor alterations to make it more fun. But we were going to do a match called the Thunderdome, which was pretty much the Elimination Chamber, and WWE's already done it? Weird. Uh, hold on, I'm going to... Throw up an image. Let me uh, do a quick uh, screen share, I guess. Give me just a moment here. Uh, James sent it to me a little bit, so... Let me know when you can see my screen, good sir. Alright. What... What the fuck? What the... What? What the fuck is this? Mike, is that... Is that a Zoom chat that I'm seeing? Because I'm seeing a lot of monitors in the ring. Oh and my god, they the turned the crowd into 2K. Oh no, they turned the camera out into a 2K audience. I found the oh. same dude in about 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, 10, oh my 11. god. I'm... This what is this? Appeared. What is this? Oh, God. Oh, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this shit? Oh, I'm speechless. I, I, I literally hit the back out of my own fucking background. Oh, no. It's oh. so bad. It's oh so God. bad. Oh my Dude. god, so terrible. Like, man. I really, I gotta, I'm doing some research. Give me about like 10 seconds, if you don't mind. Yeah, and to the audience wondering, look, we, we've already covered into Spider-Verse. As for the villain that we didn't get to talk about, who cares? If you've seen one Spider-Man film, you'll see him all. But apparently, this shit is just too important to ignore. I'm sure Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse 2 will be people great, better than the first one, but this is... People this are needs to be talked. People are paying pay-per-view ticket prices for a Zoom meeting? For a fucking Zoom call? What? <laughs> what the fuck's going on? What the fuck is happening? No. No, no, no. You don't get to do this shit. No. This is cancer. Vince. No. What are you accomplishing here? What the fuck is this trash, man? Oh, it looks so shitty. It does. It, it looks... Honest it to God, like it's, it's so unoriginal. First off, the logo's terrible. Indeed. Logo, like, trash. Arena, but, trash. But Gimmick, it's like, trash. How do you have a wrestling event with monitors? I I don't I don't get it. I don't. Well, what's the point? What's the point of all of this? I I don't know. And more importantly, why name it Thunderdome if it's just look? I understand it's why they're in a dome. Wait, like, they're in a dome, of course. Hold on one second. What's the fucking name of the Orlando hockey team? Uh, I I don't recall. I don't. Unfortunately, I don't watch a lot of hockey. The but, Solar Bears? I don't. Hold on. No, that doesn't sound right. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, Is it the basketball team I'm thinking of? Probably. But that's the Orlando Magic. What the fuck? 
Is it baseball? Is it a, is it is it a parody on a baseball team or some shit that I'm not getting? I I don't know. I I, I guess Vince was like, oh, what's the no? Because for okay, baseball, boy. that's the Gators. Sorry, for basketball, it's the Gators. For baseball, wait, is the basketball team and the baseball team the same fucking thing? Don't know what to tell you. Maybe. Well, they have they have the magic. They have. I I'm so fucking confused. No, like this is, what what the fuck? I feel like this is one of those McMahon ideas where he's just like he see he takes stuff that he sees from the medium, whether it's from TVs or movies. In this case. It's definitely from Mad Max, because, come on, but, Thunderdome. What other but, movie or show has a title named Thunderdome that's not Mad Max? And w- this isn't even done. What? WWE now. Oh, my God. It looks like such fucking garbage. I'm, I'm looking at this arena, and I, I just see Dome. I don't see Thunderdome. Just Dome. Like, what about this dome is supposed to look like it's thundering? I mean, the reason why we called the Elimination Chamber in WYW the Thunderdome was the ideology of six men enter, one man leaves. Yes, and that was going to be a, a perfect idea. Good idea, because that's how it should be. That's how an Elimination Chamber works, is six men enter, one man stays. Except the idea was six men enter, one man leaves by the end of it. True. But, like, what the fuck? Is it going to be, like, a cage? Like, is it a cage? Is it a cage match thing? Is it going to just be this big circular cage? Or is it just, we're calling it the Thunderdome? Because we can't... Because the arena takes place in a dome. I mean, there's the Thunderdome musical event, but... That's like all the way out and fuck. I I don't fucking I don't fucking know. Either this. I mean, you have Carl Anderson, uh, you know, one half of the Bullet Club, hoping that this thing fucking fails, and it probably will. True. I mean, it's in the Amway Center, I guess, but. It's going to be tonight on SmackDown. To let everybody know, this is recorded August 21st of 2020. Yeah. On a Friday night. Because we said, screw it, we might as well get this little extra bit of content out there. But, like, what the fuck is this? What is this shit? I'll tell you. It's WWE's last attempt to get the ratings up. And they're just... They're just tanking. No matter what they do, they are tanking and sinking to the bottom of the ocean with no survivors. I need I need a gun. I need to shoot myself out of this nightmare of wrestling. How do you do this? Who the fuck sat there and said, you know what we should do? Let's get a bunch of expensive ass monitors and just put the same 11 people in the crowd all over the place. I mean, this, this sounds like something you would have seen in WCW. And like, it's called Thunderdome, which makes it worse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Oh, fuck. I, I don't know what to say. I honestly... You want to just end the fucking podcast here? You know what? Yeah. How do you beat that? How do you beat that goddamn nonsense? I don't know, but all I know is if WWE fails at this, which it will, I I feel like there's no chance that we could try something that, uh, that would recreate this with the same name. The whole idea is just flat, flumped. Lumped, flat. I don't know. It's it's tarnished. It's ruined. But 
yeah, I guess you like to put it that way. Um, well, we go and, you know, cleanse our minds to the shit that we've seen. I don't know if Mike is still with me. I, I don't want to be. I, I don't want to be. <laughs> I want to. I want to be done with today. This is ladies and, my afternoon. <laughs> so, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Oh, either way, if you if you're listening to this and you already see the show, please let us know how it went. But already yeah. looking at those images makes me want to throw up in my fucking mouth. I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Open Mic Night. We are your hosts, Lionar Mike Nikos. And the executioner Michael X. Please we send us verse. <laughs> please, yeah, please send us to another universe because we're done with this one. I, I think that'd be more fun. But uh, thank you for joining the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you did enjoy. Uh, we'll see you again another time. Have we a good night. See you soon. Stay safe. God bless.